Okay, we're back. I finally figured out how the new Kindle program works. Let me just show you. You highlight like this, and then that stupid gray thing comes up, to blocking the text. All right? And if you already have it highlighted, then you get the option to highlight. If you didn't, it, option to remove it. See, if I click on this, now it's yellow. I complained that I couldn't get the yellow, but now it's yellow. All right, so this is where we're going to focus. Berlinski, like Aquinas, is broaching the topic that maybe what we see in the universe implies that God is necessary and therefore the question of God's existence is valid. Uh, hopefully I'm stating the way Berlinski is, you know, trying to express it properly. All right? Aquinas, by contrast, is saying that because what we see implies God's existence, God necessarily exists. Berlinski is not going that far. Hopefully, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, hopefully I'm stating Berlinski's position properly. Berlinski is not going as far as the conclusion in Aquinas, but he is going as far, and he started it like in chapter 2, to broach the topic of scientific inquiry with the idea of a premise that maybe what we see argues that God's existence is necessary. Of course, the term God in Berlinski's parlance, like normal parlance, is that God would be above nature. So Berlinski is not guilty of the illogic that Dawkins is guilty of. Because in Dawkins' logic, basically, God, God is provably God only if God is not God. Because God would have to be subject to nature and provably subject to nature for Dawkins to agree that God exists. So throw out Dawkins. If you're an atheist, you do not need Dawkins to justify your atheism. Just throw them away. I believe in atheism. What I don't believe in is I don't believe in the shills and the scams that atheists are imposing on other atheists. And Dawkins is a scammer. Okay, he's just a complete scammer. Him, Hitchens, God bless him, and um, Sam Harris. They are to atheism what the leaders of the King James Only movement are to the King James Only people. All those people on both sides of the fence, the atheists and those others who are theists, they should just be thrown out. Nobody should listen to them. They're just out to make money off you. Okay? I believe in atheism. It deserves better arguments than Hitchens and Dawkins and Sam Harris are using. Okay? Throw them out. Defend your atheism by other means. You have other means. You don't need these people. Okay? Just like the King James only people don't need the, their leaders to defend the King James Bible. It's ridiculous. All right. So now let's go back to Berlinski. Berlinski says science should consider the argument that God is necessary. Or at least he seems to be arguing that. Let's pretend he is. I argue against it. And you're saying, well, brain up, but you're a Christian. You bet. Because to me, that's not a valid argument. All right? Is God necessary? First of all, I can prove God exists factually from math alone. If A, then minus A. That's math, period. Okay? Fundamental, all mathematics are dependent on that as the equation for the, all the principles in math tell you that if A exists, then minus A exists, period, over and out, law of opposites. It's reflected everywhere in nature and every kind of science you want to mention. So that tells me God exists, because if the natural exists, then the supernatural exists. I don't need to know whether it's necessary. It's a fact. That's not the problem with the God question. Whether God exists in some form, well, the natural exists, so the supernatural exists. Okay, but then the supernatural, by definition, has to be the opposite of the natural. That would be necessary. 
but the existence of the supernatural, you don't even have to argue about it being necessary. If the natural exists, the supernatural exists, period, over and out, then now the question is, the bigger question for science to ponder, is, okay, what evidence of the supernatural is there, and how do we test it when all we have is the natural as a recourse? That's a big question. It's a valid question. It's an important question, and it's a difficult question. So to me, is God necessary? That's irrelevant. The natural exists, therefore he exists. Whether he's necessary or not, I don't know. There is a higher argument you can make, though, and this is just as difficult as, as the law of opposites. See, if the, if the natural exists, then what's opposite the natural? The supernatural. Period. Okay, and we know by, you know, theoretical means what that might be. You can only really find it in what's considered sort of metaphysical now. Quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics are the exact opposite of the theory of general theory of rel special or relative or general relativity. They're opposites. That's what's upsetting to the, the cosmologists. Is they're opposites. They're looking for a pair of pants that unite both. Okay? They call it the, the theory of everything. I have my own theory of everything, but I just expressed it. If A, then minus A. That means there's a connection between quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity, special or general. All I have to do is find it. It exists. Okay, because if A, then minus A. End of story. If A, then minus A. If the natural exists, therefore God exists. Necessary or not is beside the point to me. All right? So now you have to get into a, something that's more difficult than is God necessary or the law of opposites. By the law of opposites in math, God exists. Math wouldn't hang together if you didn't have the law of opposites. There'd be no such thing as math. It wouldn't work. All right? So how did math get here? Math is neither mass nor energy. Math is not subject to the laws of nature. Math's own existence is improbable. So something higher than math created math. What was it? Or who was it? Okay. God's necessarily existence. Necessary existence. You could argue from what I just said if you had to. But I don't think that's the best argument. What is the desirability of God's existence? Desirability. Now that is Alice going down the rabbit hole. I realize that. I'm arguing that the desirability of God's existence is a more important argument for science than the necessity of God's existence. Okay. To me, the necessity of God's existence is a no-brainer. It's not even an issue. I'm more concerned about whether it's a fact than whether it's necessary. But necessary is used in logic and in science to deduce facts. Okay, fine. So you can use necessary if you want. But a higher argument is going to be the desirability of God's existence. Now why... Would, the, would God's existence be desirable? Desirable. Well, think about your life right now. That's all you have to do. You don't have to go very far to analyze this. But the farther you go, the more you realize how, how valid the argument is. The argument I'm making is it is desirable that God exists. That's the proposition, which I say I claim is higher than these two. These are propositions. Dawkins, illogically, God is improbable. Throw Dawkins out. Okay? Aquinas, God is necessary to explain. Okay, well, to me, it's not necessary to explain. It's already a fact, necessary or not. But one of the ways that the Greeks and other ancient logicians argued things was based on desirability. They would have a premise. A is desirable. 
and then they would go through the premise to the conclusion and through that pr process of going from premise to conclusion would establish the fact by recourse to the desirability of the fact first. Okay? Now, that's a real sticky wicket because it's desirable for person A that peanut butter exists because he likes peanut butter. It's desirable for person B that lemon meringue pie exists because he likes lemon meringue pie and he hates peanut butter. All right? But what do you see beneath both of those arguments? Variety. You got peanut butter and you got lemon meringue pie. Both of them exist, desirable or not. Both of them exist, necessary or not. Both of them exist, improbable or not. Okay? But is it desirable that they exist? Now that is an argument and a logic process that only a human would think of. Okay? Your animals can't think in terms of whether something exists or not, or probability, or necessity, or anything like that. They only know what they like and they dislike. All right? So in that limited sense, if you take desirability as your point of departure for evaluating existence, you can see it reflected in natural science. In other words, it's desirable that life exists. Well, but life does exist, desirable or not. But it is desirable. So it is desirable that it exists, and it exists. You see the point? So you can apply the desirability criterion to natural phenomenon that you can see. Okay? And that's going to get you in a lot of trouble because, again, people have different ideas about what's desirable. But underneath that, you get back to the natural world that you see because you can find an, uh, an underlying criterion that is desirable across the board. Peanut butter exists, lemon meringue pie exists. Some people hate peanut butter, some people hate lemon meringue pie. But it's desirable that variety exists, and it does. You see the point? So, you, so by looking at the superficial facts that you can see, you can deduce underneath them the desirability criterion of, in this case, variety. All right, and that's really important because if God exists, he should be desirable. You got that? And if God exists and he creates, then what he is is going to be reflected in what he creates and what he creates should be his desire. You got that? I mean, if I want peanut butter, then I'm going to go get peanut butter. Therefore, peanut butter exists in my cupboard. You, I mean, I didn't create peanut butter. I buy it. I could create it, but I didn't. I buy it. Okay, well, God created it. Either he created the processes by which peanut butter can come to exist. He created the processes by which everything can come to exist. But for him to want to do that is a prerequisite, desirability, is a prerequisite for its existence. See, desirability is the heart of everything. We talk about morality till we're blue in the face. Why? Because it's desirable. The atheists are busy telling us, and rightly so, well, we're moral. Yeah, they are, by their own version of morality. And the Christian is moral by his own version of morality. And no, not all versions of morality are equal. But the idea that morality is desirable is universal in the human race. Well, but the idea of God being desirable is also universal in the human race. And for God, if he exists to create, it would have to be because he wanted it. And therefore, in creation, or in the existence you can see, by all of its characteristics taken together, you can back into 
what you can't see, which is God's desire about it. And therefore, you can back into the desirability of God. Now, that then focuses on the character of God. All right, which I think is a valid question for debate and a question which is not debated enough. Okay? What is the desirability of God? And our boy Berlinski here talked about that at the beginning. All right? Um, where did he talk about it? There, here. We explain what is chancy by appealing to chance. We explain creation by appealing to creators. If it is improbable, then God did not make it. The best we can say is that God made a world that would be improbable had it been produced by chance. But it wasn't, so he didn't. This is a discouraging first step in an argument said to come close to proving God does not exist. Okay, now we apply minus A to that. It is an encouraging first step in an argument said to come close to proving that God does exist. But you'll notice Berlinski isn't going that far. Okay? Because he's letting you do your own thinking. All right? It turns on what is the character of God. All right? Does God exist? Is that a desirable existence? Is that a desirable proposition? All right? And I can't find where he talks about that. So I'll have to go back to where we were. Okay. Is it desirable that God exists? Well, in evaluating that, the first thing you have to evaluate is what kind of God would God be that God would be desirable to exist? Once you establish those characteristics, then you can go look out at nature and ask yourself whether what you see in nature reflects the desirable character of God. And then if you have a contradiction between what you see in nature versus a desirable characteristic in God, then you're either going to fix your characteristics or you're going to fix what you see in nature. Okay? Because the ultimate statement about God's existence is a moral question. If God exists and he made this universe, what, why? And Berlinski talks about the why in here. Why? Why are we here? How did the universe get here? And why are we here? Those questions have to be answered to a human. We want to know why. It's, it's a burning question for us why we're here. That proves that there's something beyond nature. Because we're asking questions that nature does not ask. We're asking why. We're asking how. Animals don't ask why or how. We do. So then that implies we're not animals. That there's something unique to humanity which is above nature. All right? Therefore, you have to back into it logically or mathematically if you want it. To me, math is real simple. Does God exist? Well, but the existence of God is going to have to be determined by the desirability of God. If God exists, what must God be like? In that case, you're sort of talking about a necessary argument. If God exists, what must he be like? In order to be desirable. Desirable. All right, so write on a sheet of paper all the characteristics God would have to have to be desirable as God. Because if God exists and he made this universe, then he did it because he wanted to. And immediately there are certain things that you ought to realize. If God made this universe the way it is because he wanted to, then he didn't make it so that it would worship him. 
he doesn't need its worship. If he made it because he wanted to, then he wanted to benefit anything not God. There's no other logical conclusion. If God made something that he hates, it'd be dead already. So he must love it. Oh, well then what does that tell you? You see what I'm talking about? Now maybe I beat this into the ground, so I'll shut up now. But my argument against both of these is that we should be arguing the desirability, the desirability of God's existence. Desirability. Is it desirable that God exists, and if so, why? And then you look out at nature and you say, okay, does nature reflect the desirability of God characteristics? There's a way to know that. Okay? And people have been doing this for years, but they just don't know that's what they're doing. So, you know, yell at me if I don't make any sense. Okay? Peace out.